Heavenly Father, send your Spirit. Anoint the preaching of your Word. Soften the soil of our hearts. That your Word may go deep in and yield a harvest of righteousness. Be with us this morning, Father. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Uh, for those of you who know me, you know that I was not always a preacher. Uh, I have done a lot of things. And um, one of the things that I used to do was I was an army officer. And uh, I was in the field artillery. And there's something about the field artillery that's just amazing. An artillery shell, we're talking 155s here, is a 95-pound explosive. It's a 95-pound shell that we can lob 30 kilometers or about 17 miles. Uh, when one of these babies hits the earth, and this is just a standard round, all right? Not the special stuff, just a standard round. There's a 50-meter blast radius, all right? 100% effect. 50 meters, that's half of a football field that's get, that gets vaporized when that thing hits the ground. Before I joined the Army, um, I had seen lots of movies about being in the Army. I'd seen lots of movies about what it's like to go through combat. I'd read books, poems, there's a number of really fantastic country songs. And you know, one night I was sitting uh, on my bed uh, in my, we called it a hooch, sitting in my hooch watching my DVD player, burning some time before our next mission the next morning. It was dark out. And um, I hear this boom on the fob. Uh, which was our forward operating base, quickly followed by another boom. Now, a lot of people can't tell the difference between outgoing artillery because the guns are so huge that it's an explosion when they go off to lob those shells. But me being an artilleryman, I could hear the difference between the outgoing and incoming, and I knew the bottom of my heart with that second boom that we were getting shelled. And there's something that happens to you when you're getting shelled. There is a deep, deep terror that strikes all the way down to the core of your being. You know, have you ever seen a cat when they get scared? Like when they get truly scared? And it seems like they, they don't coil up and then jump. It doesn't matter what position they're in, all of a sudden they're up in the air, three, four feet. That happened to me. Boom, boom, and I was off the bed. I had my rifle in my hand. I flew past my roommate. He was the, our platoon sergeant, and I said, let's go, Gunny, we gotta go. And I flew out the door, and I turned on my heels straight for the bunker. And as I was racing towards the bunker with the hair on my neck standing up, I screamed, incoming! because I needed everybody else to know that we were getting shelled. And as I was running as fast as I could for the bunker, the next shells were coming in, and then the rockets were there. Like artillery, except there's a scream that comes with them. It's terrifying. And no matter how many movies you've watched, no matter how many books you've read, until you are in a bunker, feeling the concussive uh, pressure changes, and people are running, there's nobody hanging out watching their DVD player in their hooch going, don't worry, the chances of the, one of those shells falling on me. Everybody runs for refuge. Everybody runs for refuge. Because, you see, the undeniable truth is that to be shelled, to be sitting through a shelling is a horrible, horrible, terrible 
thing because it's real. Because it's real. Just because it is what it is. And I was reflecting on our psalm for the day, and I thought to myself, I think that's like God. We sing so many songs about Him. We read so much about Him. We, we have these brushes with God that are almost surreal because it's almost always a warm and fuzzy feeling. I think sometimes we forget who God is and how real God is. I think sometimes we forget how terrifyingly awesome he is. We forget that the people who have seen him face to face, the people who have been in his presence have been physically altered. The people who actually draw near to God are filled with trembling. They fall on their faces. And you know, no matter how many movies you watch about God, no matter how many poems you read about God, no matter how much of a romanticized notion you have, the real deal is very, very different. I'll be in Psalm chapter 2 and reading out of the ESV. If you have a Bible, you can turn there with me. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. Then he will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury, saying, As for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. You see, the psalmist is asking this question because he's seeing the battle lines being drawn. He sees a very real war taking place. And that is the king's of the earth, the rulers are setting themselves against God and against His anointing, His anointed. There's something that happens to the rulers of the earth. God binds them in a certain way that they want to be free of. They want to be their own gods. They want to be able to command life and death to change the weather. They want to do the things that only God can do, and they want to burst God's bonds from them. The kings of the earth are pitted against he who sits in the heavens. And the psalmist seems to be playing a little bit of a lyrical joke here, that these kings can't even remove their feet from the earth. Uh, the one they're fighting against sits in the heavens. But the kings of the earth are bound by such a simple law like gravity. And God laughs at them. He holds them in derision. This is not the Easter laugh. This is not the joyful laugh. This is a laugh of mockery. God holds them in contempt. Now, watch this. God has a secret weapon. He says it right here. He terrifies the kings of the earth. He terrifies these rulers who are setting themselves against him because he has a secret weapon. And he says, as for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. Make no mistake about it. The psalmist is talking about Jesus, who we call the Christ. God's anointed. 
He is the secret weapon. Now, the psalmist is going to take a different tone here. So we should hear Jesus speaking in this next stanza. I will tell of the decree. The Lord said to me, you are my son. Right? So we're picturing here the king that God has set on Zion speaking. The Lord said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. That is a lot of terrible power that this man we call Jesus Christ wields. But see, we err here if we think that God's secret weapon is to stand up to the kings of the earth, to the rulers, and match them force for force, violence for violence. He has, he has a way of winning they can't even comprehend. So destructive is Jesus, whom we call the Christ, to the kings and the rulers of the earth, that their empire is like a clay pot, and Jesus is like a major league baseball slugger armed with a big iron stick, a tire iron. No chance. Boom. I find it mind-blowing. And I find it just like God. That this warrior, this terrible fury, this realness of the, the, the total, complete authority of God is in the God-man, Jesus Christ, who came to serve, who came to love, who came to adopt children into his father's family. And isn't it just like Jesus to stand on Zion and say nothing that the Lord hasn't said to him already? I will tell of the decree the Lord said to me, you are my son. The nations will be made his heritage because God is God. God is all powerful. And he doesn't need to shatter the kings of the earth with an artillery barrage. Watch this. God does it with love and service and adoption. It turns out that no power on earth nor of hell can stand before Jesus who bears his cross. Jesus who wears a thorn of crowns. Jesus who puts you and I above his own well-being. He tells his disciples, he says, you know that the Gentiles have lords, and their lords act very lordly as they lord it over one another. Not so with you, but you shall be known for your service. Now come here and let me wash your feet. The power that hell cannot stand against, O oh church, is not our ability to garner a lot of votes. Our ability to arm ourselves and take over by force of arms. The thing that this world cannot stand against is you and I bearing our cross and following our Lord and Jesus as he goes to die for other people. That the ends of the earth would fill his father's house in this miracle of adoption. You see, the temptation for us is to think of God in this romanticized, gentle way. And actually, that's how you surely perish. Because the truth that Jesus brings us is a condemnation on one hand and an invitation on the other. And it all depends on how seriously you take him. 
And I'm telling you, we're supposed to take him as seriously as a soldier takes an artillery barrage. Because he is very real. Let us read the next stanza together. The psalmist turns his attention, it seems, from the speaking king on God's holy hill to those people who are arrayed in battle against God. And he says, now therefore, O kings, be wise. Be warned, O rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the sun, lest he be angry and you perish in the way, for his wrath is quickly kindled. Catch this. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. Like a very scared Lieutenant Palmer in a bunker in the Fob Kalsu, Iraq, screaming incoming. The people who make it into the bunker as the shelves are falling all around you are allowed a certain sense of elation. They're allowed a certain sense of total and complete gratitude that they are in the bunker. Because the reality of the artillery strike cannot penetrate the thickness of the concrete walls that surround you. So we have our way to make this reality of Jesus, whom we know to be the Christ, this holy super weapon that God is wielding against his foes, we are invited to join his team, to be adopted into his family through this motion of kissing the sun. And I would like to read to you two passages, uh, very short, about two different people who actually kissed Jesus. This is from Luke chapter 7 and verse 36. One of the Pharisees asked him to eat with him, and he went into the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. And behold, a woman of the city who was a sinner, when she learned that he was reclining at the table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of ointment, and standing behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head and kissed his feet and anointed them with the ointment. Now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would have known who and what sort of woman this is who is touching him, for she is a sinner. And Jesus answering said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. And he answered, Say it, teacher. A certain money lender had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. When they could not pay, he canceled the debt of both. Now which of them will love him more? Simon answered, the one, I suppose, for whom he canceled the larger debt. And he said, you have judged rightly. Then turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, but she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but from the time I came in, she has not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore, I tell you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven. For she loved much, but he is who is forgiven little, loves little. And he said to her, your sins are forgiven. Do you see how kissing the son is actually related to our forgiveness? Do you see that this super weapon that God has set against the enemy 
is one of love and forgiveness? And do you see how we enter into it? The kiss is one of loyalty, yes, as a knight would kiss a king in the medieval ages in order to pledge their loyalty to say, when you go to war, I go with you. You have my sword and my shield. But this biblical picture gives us this intimate sense of what this woman was doing who wanted to do something for Jesus, who kissed him, maybe not even knowing what it meant. But because of where her heart was at in relation to Jesus the Savior, her sins were forgiven, and I tell you, there is no force in hell nor on earth that can assault that truth. That woman is saved. As saved as I was in the bunker. More so, because no weapon that was formed against her will ever be able to do its work. Now, let me give you one more from the same book, chapter 22 and verse 47. While he was still speaking, there came a crowd, and the man called Judas, one of the twelve, was leading them. And he drew near to Jesus to kiss him. But Jesus said to him, Judas, would you betray the Son of Man with a kiss? It'll go on here. We don't have time to go on, though it's very interesting. The next thing the disciples start talking about is whether or not they should become violent with those people who have come against the king. And Jesus says, no, no, no. Heals the guy who gets his ear cut off by Peter and goes very dutifully about his father's will on a hill just outside of Zion to be crucified. It occurs to me that this motion of kissing the sun cannot be an empty motion. The intent of our heart is what God judges. It is a matter of the heart where our loyalty is, who we are intimate with, who we will follow. And if you choose to follow Jesus, he says, pick up your cross and follow me. And finally, loyalty goes both ways, doesn't it? Isn't that the rescue? That when we kiss the Son, he shall eternally kiss us. There is no trouble we can get into, congregation, that Jesus and his love and forgiveness can't overcome. There is no task that God can set before you. There is no enemy great enough that can stand when you pick up your cross and follow Jesus because you have kissed him and pledged your loyalty to him. We here at the Adopted Church celebrate communion together and Communion is a way for us to pledge our loyalty and look to our strength and our shield. While I come to prepare the elements, I would ask that you would spend a moment of time reflecting on the word that has been preached today and how God is asking you to kiss his son and to pick up your cross and to follow him, that his will might be accomplished. Heavenly Father, you sit in the heavens and laugh at the vain plotting of the mighty and those that we would call high and powerful. Father, you have picked the lowly and the humble. You have picked the likes of me us to represent you and your power in this world. And Father, we thank you for that. We ask that you would strengthen us for the task at hand that you have given 
to each and every one of us. We ask that you would bless our taking of communion together, that truly we would be bound together as your family with one spirit, with one Savior. In your name we pray, amen.